This afternoon, I, I wanted to take an opportunity to uh, give you a bit of an update on the integrated watershed management initiatives that are going on at the district. Uh, for those of you that were, were at our or the last MWC meeting back in the spring, um, you'll know that that was sort of my first introduction, uh, having just come on and onto the district and uh, wanted to give you a bit of a background on what we've been up to over the last month or so, or pardon me, the last few months. So uh, back in the spring, if, if you'll recall, uh, the province announced that there was an initial investment of uh, over $4 million to, to look at uh, ways that we can reduce impacts of flooding and address sort of watershed health within the Muskoka River watershed as a whole. Uh, a little later on in the, in the spring, uh, the district was able to receive uh, the lion's share of that, that funding. Uh, and really that funding was, was in order to advance 12 separate technical projects um, related to, uh, and, and some you know, staff dollars, things like that, uh, but really to, to fund and get these uh, initiatives off the ground. Um, in addition to the, to the, the technical projects, uh, the district has been working alongside Muskoka Watershed Council to establish what's what's called the Community Round Table. And I know Kevin Trimble will be providing a bit more of an update on, on where that group is at uh, a little later on this afternoon. So uh, one of the things that I, I would point out about this funding and, and these projects that uh, I think is, is really important is that we're looking at the scale of the watershed. And the, the image that's here, I think, is very telling because it shows very quickly that when we're talking about the watershed, which is the, the area in green on that image, um, we see that it, it covers, you know, several municipalities. It's also cover, or it's also ends up in three different upper tier municipalities as well um, as these the lower tier municipalities that we see there. So we know that um, there's a lot of complexity already just by looking at the scale of the watershed. Um, and that's really where this funding is coming in, is we're trying to start to gather information about the existing conditions to eventually look towards uh, a watershed, uh, integrated watershed management strategy or plan for the Muskoka River watershed. As part of the work that we've been up to over the past summer, uh, we, uh, the district has formed uh, three separate task forces, uh, a water quality task force, a water quantity task force, and a terrestrial task force. And uh, several of you here today are, are uh, participating on these task forces. And really what the task forces have been up to is it, it brought together, um, I'll say it's a, a meeting of the technical minds. We, we've tried to uh, bring together folks that have some technical background and can help us with uh, looking at the scope of work for these, for these technical projects, as well as helping to address questions or um, you know, concerns or things like that as they, they come up as these projects get running. You'll see on this slide here that we've, we've got the 12 projects listed um, and they're sort of, they've been broken down by the different task forces here. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to point out was that you'll also see that there's some overlap and that the task forces are also looking at, or multiple task forces are looking at the same project. And that's really because, uh, you know, of the interaction between these projects they're not intended to be standalone uh, bits of information that that you know aren't really linked as uh, as the integrated side of integrated watershed management suggests. The way that these projects are going to be the most successful is is by um, allowing them to be linked and, and then brought together at the end when we're forming the eventual plan or strategy. Uh, I'd also point out that that on this slide, there's a couple of uh, couple of the projects are are bold and the other ones aren't. The ones that are, are bold are the ones that have either been awarded or currently out for uh, out for bid at this time. So that's the lion's share of them. It'll be eight out of the the twelve that will be um, awarded as of the end of October. So just to give a, a bit more detail on some of these these projects and and what we're talking about. Uh, in the early stages, the, the projects that are currently out, we're looking at a hydrologic model. Um, and for those of you not familiar with hydrologic models, what we're hoping that this one will, will provide when it's done is it'll let us look, uh, look at how water moves through the watershed and get a better understanding. So when we talk about water moving through the watershed, we're talking about runoff and meltwater. Um, we're talking about you know the rains that we've just gotten uh, over this past week. How does that amount of water entering the watershed 
Um, where does it go? Where does it pool? Where do the water levels come up? Things like that. And so that hydrologic model will, will give us a, an opportunity to, to really sort of, um, you know, try out a couple of different simulations and, and see what happens in the watershed and will give us a, a very powerful tool moving forward. Um, we're also working on expanding the floodplain mapping. Some of you may be aware where that uh, in 2019 and 2020, we had a, the sort of first phase of floodplain mapping project. And we're currently adding in uh, an additional phase that will be building on that original work and mapping further areas in the, in the watershed. Um, really, it's looking primarily at the, the vulnerable or what we're, we're calling the high risk areas. Um, and the mapping here that's been provided is showing just a, a bit of what that map looks like for uh, uh, stretches of the upper uh, Big East River, just, just south of Arrowhead there. Next couple of, of projects, uh, these two projects are very closely related, the operational adjustments and the scoping study. They're both fixed uh, on looking at the Muskoka River water management plan. Uh, and this, this is the plan that's currently in place, and it's really heavily directed uh, towards uh, looking not really at flooding, but looking at uh, hydro generation and maintaining navigation levels and things like that in the, the watershed. So these two projects will look at uh, the existing plan to try to first come up with, are there ways without really adjusting the whole plan? Can we uh, do what, what Chris Craig calls nudges or, or just sort of adjusting uh, what those different operational levels might be to, to help us deal with uh, flooding and, and increasing our ability to attenuate floods. Um, the other side of that will be to, to look at what would it take um, to actually open up the Muskoka River Water Management Plan and um, redo it, recognizing uh, some of the, the issues that we're currently facing in the watershed. Um, what would it require to do that and, and uh, you know, come up with a, a new approach to managing the water uh, in the watershed? So that's, that's the, the second study here. These next two studies are also uh, very closely related. And uh, the Structural Mitigation Options Project is, is really to look at um, all the different dams and the, the structures that we currently have in the watershed and see what can be done to those existing structures. Th those structures are not designed, again, to do anything to do with flood control. They're designed to um, help move water through the system, uh, primarily to maintain things like navigation. And interestingly enough, a lot of them were actually designed to help move logs through the, the watershed as part of historical logging opportunities. Um, so that project will, will start looking at what can we do with what's already there. And then the flood modifications review kind of builds on that and then says, well, what could we do if we were going to do large scale infrastructure? And when I say that, I mean um, green and gray infrastructure. And so that might be things like, what if we increased uh, and made a big reservoir wetland? Or what if we just created a big wet reservoir pond somewhere? Um, those kinds of ideas. Those are very basic, but uh, just to give you a bit of an idea of what, what they might look at um, in those projects. The next couple of projects, um, these ones are, are uh, quite interesting, at least I, I think, not that all of them aren't, but uh, the Natural Capital Inventory is really designed to look at um, all of the different natural features that we have within the watershed and see what we can do. We know that there's a lot of information about those features and that information is spread out in a lot of different places. And so the first step in that project is to pull that information together and then look at what can we do to improve our mapping on those features or expand it. For example, some of our wetland mapping is incomplete uh, within the watershed. And, uh, you know, some wetlands have been mapped, some wetlands haven't been mapped, some wetlands have been mapped, but not all of them have been mapped. So those are just examples of, of different um, products that may come out of the natural capital inventory. The next one is the land use policy review. And this is an interesting project where uh, if you think back to that map that I, I showed at the beginning of the uh, our, our presentation here with the, uh, the different municipalities within the watershed, you can imagine that the land use policies that each one of those uh, those municipalities have is not exactly the same. And in fact, there are differences between the water or between the different municipalities. Um, the best example might be that on Lake Muskoka, um, that lake is split across both 
uh, Gravenhurst and uh, Township of Muskoka Lakes. And in Township of Muskoka Lakes, you can have a boathouse, but you're not allowed to have a boathouse in the town of Gravenhurst. Same lake, two different municipalities, two different land use policies. And so that's one of the things that this review will do is to look at those types of things and identify not about pointing fingers and saying somebody is doing it right or somebody's doing it wrong, but just start to, to identify where those differences and where those similarities might be. The other side of, or the other piece of that review is to look beyond Muskoka and to say, where else do we have these watershed um, strategies or these watershed plans in place? And there's several down in southwestern Ontario. And to look at what do the land use policies look like in those areas? And what is the framework that they're using for their land use policy? Um, and pull that together and to give us a bit of an idea of what our land use policy framework might look like when we have more, more information and we're, we're looking to uh, put together that watershed strategy. As we move into the, the last four projects, um, we get into a little, little bit more about how to uh, monitor the, the watershed. And so these projects are focused, uh, these two of course are, are somewhat self-explanatory. Um, water quality indicators is, is really to build on. We know that there is a lot of good information. The district is gathering some um, in our, our water quality monitoring. We know that there's cottage associations that are also doing water quality monitoring. And we know that there are other um, developments that have water quality monitoring approvals required of them. And so we know that there's a lot of that information around and available in the watershed. But again, it's in a lot of different locations. And so part of this project will be to pull all of that information together, figure out who's doing what and where and why, and give us a bit of an idea about how a, a comprehensive water quality monitoring program within the watershed, what it might look like and what it might be actually measuring and tracking. The watershed health indicators project is a little bit different because it's not looking just at water quality, but it's looking at what are the ways that we could measure watershed health. And uh, right now we, as a lot of you will be familiar, we have the Muskoka River watershed report cards. Um, and those look at the different municipalities and talk about a lot of different variables. Uh, those variables often change and uh, they give us some really good information, but the intent of this, uh, this study is to really look at um, what are the good things that are being done and what are the things that we can do in the future to sort of track the health of the watershed and monitor it in the long term. The last two projects um, are identifying areas, the, the first one being the erosion survey, is identifying areas in the watershed where erosion has occurred, um, primarily because of fluctuating water levels. In the case like this image here of the, the Big East, um, we know that sandy soil, um, it's moving for a variety of natural reasons and it's mo moving for a variety of reasons to do with um, storm events and things like that. So we want to identify areas within the watershed that are eroding like this because that kind of, of uh, migration of material can have implications for uh, within the rest of the watershed. So we need a bit of an idea of where those things are, are occurring. And we're also looking for uh, information on sort of what can be done about monitoring these areas and potentially remediating them in the, the long term. And then finally, uh, the last project will look at public access. And it's important to, to remember that we're talking about the watershed as a whole. So we're not just interested in access to shorelines and, and lakes and things like that, but we're also interested in access to uh, public terrestrial areas. So um, conservation areas or um, other areas where, where the public currently either may or may not have access to areas of crown land. And that inventory is intended not just to look at where are those current areas, but also to look at uh, providing some recommendations on good and bad places for public access or how much uh, too much public access is, uh, or pardon me, how much access is too much or how much access should be uh, increased in different areas. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a better idea about the, uh, the general uh, sort of scope and some of the ideas about the projects that we're talking about. Above and beyond the, the projects, we also have uh, a big side of our work is in communications. And, and that's what Cassie's been up to in, 
Cassie's been working really hard uh, to, to get our communications up and running. Um, we've got uh, an engage page, the Making Waves Integrated Watershed Management is up and live. Um, and that gets updated on a regular basis. So it's a good spot to come back to and, uh, and take a look if you're looking for updates. Um, we've also put out uh, several media releases and some uh, public communications and presentations uh, like this one, as well as one at the Muskoka Lakes Museum. Um, and there's been some media releases as well. Uh, we're also working uh, to reach out to the eight local First Nations and engage those communities as well. Um, we've had some good success uh, doing that very initially uh, around the floodplain mapping project, but we're looking to, uh, to further increase our, our engagement within the watershed. And finally, it's always helpful, at least in my mind, if we, we sort of talk a little bit about timelines and, and where we're at and where the project is running. So we started this project back in April. Um, and again, in, in the spring, we sort of established uh, the steering committee and we brought staff on and, and got running with the, uh, the community round table. And uh, through the summer, we, we initiated and, and got the task forces up and running. And really at this stage, um, through the last half of the summer, we were getting the projects uh, up and running. And as I said before, there one has been awarded and the other ones are out for bid, uh, closing at the beginning of October, hopefully being awarded by the end of October. Um, and then those last four projects that, that we were just talking about there will be initiated through the fall um, as, as we finish off the scope of work and getting them running. Um, and all of that will then run and the projects will be, uh, will be off and, and uh, sort of live, if you will with completion happening uh, kind of late 2022 into 2023. 